This is a quick guide to the Newport 11, a biplane fighter of the First World War. Between late summer of 1915 and early spring of 1916, the aviation arm of the German army had effective air superiority over the Western Front, about six months that became to be known as the Fokker Scourge. This was due to the introduction of the Fokker Eindecker, a fast, manoeuvrable fighter that was revolutionary in terms of implementation and in that it introduced tactics and rules of dogfighting that remain relevant today. I have covered the Fokker Eindecker in a previous video. Though an effective fighter, it was primarily effective in that they were simply not the aircraft to properly combat it. Allied losses during this period were relatively light compared with later in the war, simply because there weren't that many Eindeckers deployed, but their presence over the battlefield caused significant consternation. The threat had to be countered, and it was. Two aircraft are credited with the Allies regaining air superiority. The Newport 11, nicknamed Bebe, or Baby in English, and the Airco DH-2, which will be the subject of a future video. As is often the case when comparing opposing aircraft, they were superior in most respects to the Eindecker, but not in all, and one of their advantages, especially that of the Newports, was the sheer numbers employed. In a dogfight, it often came down to the capabilities of the pilots involved, rather than sheer technological superiority, and a well-handled Eindecker could still prevail. However, quantity, in this case effective quantity, has a quality all its own. Founded by Édouard de Liepor in 1906, the Société Anonyme des Établissements de Newport was a respected designer and manufacturer of aircraft. In January 1914, Gustave Delange signed on as the chief designer. Under their combined auspices, the Newport 11 was already in prototype form when the Eindecker commenced the Fokker Scourge and first saw flight in May of 1915. The Newport 11 started out life as the Newport 10, a successful two-seater reconnaissance biplane that saw service from 1915 through the end of the war. By removing provision for the observer, the result was a smaller, lighter, faster aircraft. In an attempt to merge the advantages of a monoplane and a biplane, Delange had come up with a somewhat revolutionary wing arrangement, with a large upper wing and a smaller staggered lower wing of a type that became known as a sesquiplane. This, plus the V-shaped strut supports, resulted in lower drag, greater lift, and improved visibility over its contemporaries, including other monoplanes. Additionally, the self-supporting box of the wing arrangement resulted in a stronger, more rigid structure than the monoplanes of the time. Fully developed interrupter mechanisms were not yet available to the Allies, so the new Port 11's armament was a single Lewis light machine gun, and because the advantages of a fixed machine gun firing forwards were now appreciated, it was mounted well above the pilot's head, clear of the propeller arc. A major disadvantage was the limited 47-round drum magazine, so various provisions were made to allow the machine gun to be slid downwards to be reloaded. Compared with the more copious ammunition supply of the belt-fed MG0815 mounted on the Eindecker, this was a significant disadvantage in combat. Likewise, dealing with the inevitable stoppages was much easier for the Fokker's pilot to deal with, the breach being within easy reach. An additional problem was the line of fire of the Lewis being several feet above the pilot's line of sight, and sights had to be devised to accommodate this. Nonetheless, such a significant offset would have caused problems during combat, and it would have been entirely possible at close range to shoot clean over an opposing aircraft. Synchronizing the line of fire with the sights is always an issue when aircraft armament is out of line of a pilot's line of sight, and this would return to plague aerial combat when ring-mounted guns were adopted. At a top speed of 97 miles per hour, the Newport 11 was somewhat faster than the Eindecker and more manoeuvrable. Its use of ailerons, compared with the Fokker's wing warping, greatly contributed to this advantage, as less physical effort was required, lessening pilot fatigue, which is a significant factor. Both aircraft featured responsive and capricious rudder controls, which would aid in a dogfight. 
History has demonstrated that some degree of instability in a fighter is beneficial, contributing to maneuverability at the cost of safety, requiring suitable training and an experienced pilot to properly utilize it. Although the first Newport 11 seems to have seen service in November of 1915 with the British Royal Naval Air Service, the French chose to stockpile their new fighter until sufficient numbers had accumulated to make a difference. With delivery starting in January 1916, by February 90 were in frontline service, and along with improved tactics, specifically the use of hunter-killer groups, began to turn the tide in the air. 90 may not sound much, but for the air war at the time this represented a significant boost. Curiously, while the Eindecker's capabilities were a spur to the development of similar tactics, they lagged behind the French, specifically, and German comments of the time reflect this. The situation is summarized nicely by German pilot Oberleutnant Rudolf Berthold. He states, We had too few qualified monoplanes, we lacked an aircraft that was easily manoeuvrable in combat. We had fallen asleep on the laurel wreaths that the single-seaters in the hands of a few superlative pilots had achieved. It was not the monoplane itself, but the pilots who were responsible for the success. One need but compare the number of Fokker fighters at the front with those few pilots who had victories. I had already requested a new type of aircraft in January 1916, a small biplane. People laughed. The Frenchman, meanwhile, takes our experience to heart, quietly builds small biplanes and then launches hundreds at once against our lines. He has achieved air superiority, and with grinding teeth we must watch while he shoots down our monoplanes and we're helpless. The advantage in numbers is illustrated by the start of the Battle of Verdun in February of 1916. The German army had available to it only 21 Fokker Eindeckers, compared with 90 Newport 11s fielded by the French. Even as Newport 11s began arriving in quantity, modifications began. In the field, the 80 horsepower Lorone 9C rotary engine was replaced by the more powerful 110 horsepower Lorone 9J, resulting in a top speed of 102 miles per hour and significantly improved rates of climb, though the heavier power plant reduced maneuverability. Soon, aircraft leaving the factory were likewise updated, resulting in the new Port 16. Though faster, it was more idiosyncratic due to the nose-heavy characteristics, requiring a good pilot to master it. To fix the handling problems, an increased wingspan was developed, and the resulting Newport 17 began seeing combat from May of 1916. Along with a properly mounted and synchronized Vickers machine gun installed in the fuselage ahead of the pilot, the Newport 17 quickly supplanted the 11s and 16s and stayed in service until the following year. In only a year, the air war had been transformed. To give some idea of the rapidly increasing scope of the air war over the Western Front, approximately 416 Fokker Eindeckers of all types were manufactured. In response, 1,000 Newport 11s and 16s were built by the French, another 646 by the Italians, and 200 by the Russians. The Newport 17 amassed an impressive total of 3,600. Illustrating the advantage of the new ports, some few that had been captured were fitted with synchronized machine guns and flown by individual German pilots. It went on to influence significantly future designs of German aircraft. Only one original Newport 11 is known to survive. It is on display at the Musée de l'Air in France. If you have questions, please leave them in the comments below and I shall answer them in a dedicated video.